Welcome to Warriors for Christ podcast. <clears throat> I'm Sam. Doing a recording from home. I know it's been a while since our last recording. Uh, <clears throat> Kyle was on some business travel and we tried to meet up and it just didn't work out. A lot of things God has put on my heart. I had a lot of conversations with people. So I have a lot of things to share. Uh, I know upcoming here we're going to want to do some podcasts on um, several church in actions to give you insight of the power of God and how God works and communicates uh, today still <clears throat> in amazing ways that much of all the, quote, people who believe in God across the world do not experience uh, because they just are missing power because they don't have faith in it. So we'll be getting those out. But um, today I want to do a podcast on we need to put on Christ. We're commanded to put on Christ. There's many people I know who think they have put on Christ, but they haven't. And so I want to go through some things in the book of Ephesians. I'm just going to speak as God leads me here today. So why don't we open up in prayer? Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Just focus on your word and on you. Father, you want us to walk in the image of your Son, to be bearers of your glory and your holiness, just as Christ was. We can't do that on our own. Father, we can only do it with your power, with your help. That's why we must be transformed. We must put on Christ. The old man must be removed, and the new man must be put on. I know there's many who are listening who think they've done that. I thought I had done that. I was convinced in my mind I had done that before. But now I know I had not. And now I know what the evidence and the power that ensues and the life that results when it truly has happened. Father, give me your wisdom and your utterance to speak your words, to communicate your truth to all those that are listening that they may understand and know what it means to put on Christ. I pray this, O Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, actually before that, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. In the very beginning, in the beginning of time, before creation, God had a purpose. See, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Just as He, being the Father, chose Him, or chose us in Him, God chose us before the foundation of the world, that we, you, everyone who's listening, that you and I would be holy and blameless before God. You see, that's what God wants. What does that mean? Holy and blameless by an act of what Christ did, but nothing of ourselves? And most people would say, well, no, we should have righteousness. It should result, but then still struggle with sin. The old man. God doesn't want us serving two masters. So why is it that most people who confess themselves as Christ's followers in the world today still produce both kinds of fruit and justified in the word of God? Oh, we all know that we were born one way before we put on Christ. Everybody would acknowledge and agree that before we put on Christ, obviously we're going to have sin in our life. But is it to continue? Is it to be a daily battle? A struggle that we war against, but yet we still do it? 
No. I would say no, it is not to be that way. And I would say God's word teaches and explains that. You have to look at the narrative of the entire book and you'll see that any other belief system would be contradicted in the Bible. If somebody thinks that it's normal to continue to struggle with sin. I don't speak that to judge anybody, but just the reality of the power of God when the power of God touches someone. See, in Ephesians chapter 2, I'm sure many of you have heard verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one may boast. Oh, that is true. Only God can save us. We cannot save ourselves. It truly is a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit that does a work that brings salvation into our life. And so much more. You see, when it happens, we put on Christ. It changes us. That's specifically discussed in Ephesians 4, but chapter 4. But before we get here, as we still look at Ephesians... See, what God wants us to know in the prayer, still in chapter 1, that the God of our Lord, that the God, in verse 17, that the God, which God? The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, that God, the Father of glory, the Father, that He might give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your heart having been enlightened, so that you have known what is the hope of his calling. The riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints. What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? In accordance with the working of the strength of his might. It's not about our power or our work. The same power and strength in verse 20 which he brought about in Christ when he raised him, Christ, from the dead. And seated Jesus at his right hand. You see, that's the power that I also pray for you who are listening. That you will experience. That the eyes of your heart will be enlightened in the same way. So that you will know what the true hope of the calling is supposed to be. So that you can know and experience the surpassing greatness of God's power towards those who truly do believe. This is a prayer to all future people to be converted in acknowledgement and recognition to all the people who already have. You see, going back to chapter 2, we were in chapter 1 there. I just looked at uh, some passages towards the end. Now in chapter 2, in verse 1, he says, And you, referring to these people who had been, had been enlightened, they had received the Spirit. He says, And you, when you were being dead in your trespasses and sin, that's a present tense, verb, even though sometimes many Bibles read it as past tense, it's present. When you were being dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked, verse 2, catch the formerly part? You see, we don't continue to walk that way. It's supposed to be a former matter of life in which you walked. And what was that according to? Well, until you receive the Spirit of God, and when you're still dead in sins, you're walking according to, as it says, the course of this world. According to the prince of power of the air. We know that is the devil. Of the Spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. See, until you put on Christ, you're still a son of disobedience. Paul acknowledges that he too used to live that way. Not anymore. Used to. Past. Verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as all the rest. You see, if it's 
still living that way. If it's no longer a former, but it's still a present, well, you're still, unfortunately, a child of wrath. As God says right here in his word, just as everybody else. The question is, have you truly been raised up and seated in Christ? Have you truly been saved by the grace of God? If you have, in verse 10 of chapter 2, then you are now God's workmanship. God did a work in you. We are now His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Well, not evil works, good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That is what we are to be doing. We are to be walking in those things. Now, we all know that it has to all start with the receiving of the promise of the Holy Spirit. We did episodes on that. Chapter 3 goes on to talk about whether or not you've been strengthened with the power of God in your spirit. And we know that the power of God leads us to overcome sin. You'll find that starting in chapter 3, verse 16. I'm just going through a quick highlight narrative to get to chapter 4. Verse 16, that he, being the Father, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his, God's Spirit, in the inner man. Okay, God wants to do a work in you. He wants to strengthen you with his power. Remember earlier that you would know the surpassing greatness of power in you, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead? Is it in you? Have you clothed yourself with Christ? Verse 17, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. So that you being rooted and grounded in love might be able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the breadth, length, height, and depth? And to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. That you might be filled up to all the fullness of God. If you haven't been filled up to all the fullness of God, it's because you have not been strengthened by His Spirit in the inner man. There's a problem. You need to be clothed with Christ. So that in verse 20, to Him, to the Father, God, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine, according to God's power that works in us. Again, is God's power working in you. Now, unfortunately, the problem is until you attain to that position, until you attain to the perfect man as God defines it in chapter 4, until you're able to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, that's in chapter 4, verse 1, Well, the Bible says you are still an infant. Now, people might say, oh, goody, goody, I'm an infant in Christ. Praise God. Well, no, listen to the episode we did. Infants uh, don't inherit the kingdom of God. You have to receive sonship. And we did an episode on that as God explains it. But in chapter 4, verse 14, it says, as a result, we are no longer to be this infant. Why? Why? Well, he tells us why. Infants are tossed here and there by waves. Infants are carried about by every wind of doctrine. They aren't grounded in truth. They're bounced around by all this different teaching, false teachings, these different winds of doctrine. By the trickery of men, as God calls it. By craftiness, as God says. And all this doctrine they're being bounced about, round by, God says it's in deceitful scheming. Uh, n- not that you who are listening are scheming deceitfully, purposefully against others, but, but that you are being schemed through the deceitful works of the devil. You see, devil has a whole fleet of people preaching Christ crucified, the good news, the Holy Spirit, believe in Jesus. It's just not in truth. People have a lot of good intentions, but without power and truth, it's, well, frankly, it's, it's nothing. It cannot benefit, it cannot save you. So how do you not be this infant who's deceived? You see, how do you come to the knowledge of the truth when you continue to be deceived and carried around by all this deceitful doctrine? 
How can you put your faith in the true knowledge of the Son of God when you continue to be deceived and bounced by wind and waves and the storms of lies? Well, that's the person who, in chapter 4, verse 13, has attained to the unity of the faith. They have attained to the knowledge of the Son of God, not the false knowledge, but the actual true knowledge of the Son of God. They have attained to the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And I actually missed a phrase right after the knowledge of the Son of God. It says they have also attained to the perfect man. That's teleos. The perfect man, which is defined as the measure and stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, have you put on Christ. Are you no no longer now the infant in Christ who's deceived? Who can't come to the unity of the faith, the true knowledge of the Son of God or the perfect man, the same fullness of Christ? Because you haven't heard the full truth. I'm not saying you don't want to. I'm sure you do. I know I did. Trust me. 40 years. I would have told you and argued on this call, if I was speaking to my old self, that absolutely I had already arrived at that position. But that was based upon what I was taught and what I understood to be truth. I didn't realize I had some deficiencies in my knowledge. Again, I'm going through a narration of the book of Ephesians. You can try to come up with a different narrative, but the problem is the Bible is going to contradict you if you look at the book of Ephesians. You will not find another truth in the book of Ephesians. Or for that matter, other books. And we will be going through several books. We're going to do several series on this. I'm going to look at several different books as God has convicted me. So some people, in verse 15 of chapter 4, Speaking truth and love, there are some people out there that still need to grow up into him who is the head, Christ. It's an aorist tense. Grow up. It's an event. You have to grow up still. Some people have not grown up. They have not yet put on Christ. In verse 17, God has to some people who still haven't put on Christ, I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. In the futility of your mind, darkened in your understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance That's inside of you because of the hardness of your heart. No, no. See, you aren't supposed to walk that way. If you walk that way, those people are excluded from the life of God. I don't want you to be excluded from the life of God. And I know that you don't want to be excluded from the life of God. But God is giving an instruction to some of you out there that even though you confess Christ, you're still excluded from the life of God because you still don't walk as God wants you to walk, not because it's not your desire, not because it's not your will to do so, and I'm sure it's probably not for many of you because you aren't trying really hard. But it's not about trying. It's about whether or not the power of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, is in you and has worked in, done a work in you to where the old man has been put off and the new man has been put on. It's not you trying. It's whether or not God has done the work. So then to some people, God challenges you in verse 20. But you didn't learn Christ in this way. But there's a big if. Verse 21. If indeed... You have heard of him and have been taught in him just as the truth is in Jesus. The question is, have you truly been taught and learned Christ in the proper way? Have you truly been taught the truth that was demonstrated in Christ? If not... 
then that just means you learn Christ incorrectly, as the Bible says here. So what does it mean to learn Christ properly? What does it mean if indeed you have heard of Christ and been taught in Christ, just as the truth is in Jesus? Well, this is the truth that is in Christ, that you are to be taught and what you should have learned. Verse 22 That in reference to your former manner of life, that life that's supposed to be former, the old life, not the current life that still persists in some of you. It was to be put off. The former manner of life was to be put aside. That former manner of life, which if you still have, is corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Or for some of you, the few who have put it off, you put off that old self that was corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, but it's no longer on you anymore. It's been put off. We covered more of what that is of when the old self is crucified. It's a work of God that he does at the spiritual baptism. Let's discuss more in Romans chapter 6. When the old man is put to death in your spiritual baptism into the death of Christ, when he then raises you in his spirit in the newness of life, he renews you in the spirit of your mind in verse 23. That you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. Now, it's something that we cooperate with God, but God has to do, and he can only do it through faith. It's not through effort of man or trying. It's an event. It's spiritual baptism. It's an event. You put on the new self, which in the likeness of God, not of this world, not of man, not of the nature of man, not the sins of the struggles, and we're going to cut continue because he's going to give us examples of what it looks like to put on Christ, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now, this isn't just a cliche of, oh, yes, it's about the truth that Jesus died for me. No, there's so much more. That's the half truth. I'm talking about the full truth, everyone. That's further defined as you keep reading in chapter four of Ephesians. So you know exactly what it is. So first, for some of the people who were still infants, some of the people who hadn't yet escaped from the futility of their mind and the darkness and their understanding, those who were still excluded from the life of God, for those people, God says in verse 25, he says, lay aside the falsehood. Stop lying to one another. Speak truth to one another, to each one of your neighbors. We have to speak truth to everybody. We need to get everybody to this point. Verse 26, an imperative command. Be angry, but you cannot sin. You cannot let sun go down on your anger. Now, there's a difference between the anger of man and the righteous anger of God. God's not sinning when he has a righteous anger. We are to be angry about the lies in the church. We are to be angry about the deceit that's going on, deceiving people to to lead them to the point they believe they're going to heaven when they aren't. God is not happy with that. He burns with indignation at those lies and deceit. Verse 27, it says, You're no longer, it's a command to give the devil an opportunity. Are you still giving the devil an opportunity in your life? Verse 28, you must steal no longer. No, you can't. Not if you put on Christ. You can't have any thievery in your life. No, you have to labor performing with your own hands what is good so that you'll have something to share with one who has need. Verse 29, let no, no, zero, none unwholesome word proceed forth from your mouth. Are you able to do that? No. What's the problem? Have you not put on Christ? If you did, these are imperative commands. It's no longer to happen anymore. 
Read James chapter 1, verse 26. The man who cannot bridle his tongue, but he thinks he's religious. God says he deceives his own heart. His religion is worthless. But again, some of the people still had not done this. Another imperative command, stop grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Or do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Well, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit of God? If you sin. He commands us that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By, you, by whom you were sealed until the day of redemption. For those who have been marked with the Holy Spirit that now indwells them. Are we to have any bitterness, anger, clamor, wrath among us? No, verse 31 says, All bitterness, all wrath, all anger, clamor, slander must be put away from you, along with all malice. Again, did you learn Christ in the true way? Was the old man put off? Was Christ truly put on? Now notice here he says, you can't have any anger, but yet verse 25 he says, You are to be angry, but not sin. Well, to be angry is in the context of the lies and speaking truth versus these people who who don't speak the truth, but deceive people. Who teach different uh, false doctrines, the waves and the wind. But with respect to anger of man, the bitterness of man, the wrath of man, the clamor of man, the slander of man, the malice of man. Oh, no, 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 you can't have any of that. Chapter 5, verse 1, you're commanded, imperative command, to be an imitator of God. Chapter 5, verse 2, you're commanded to walk in love just as Christ loved you. And just as he gave himself as an offering and sacrifice. And we did that. We're commanded to be a holy living sacrifice. We did an episode on that and how God defines what that is. More of that comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12. And for and uh, First Peter, verse three of chapter five, there can be no immorality, impurity, or greed can even be named among the saints of God. None. There must be no filthiness. You cannot have any filthiness or sin. You cannot have any silly talk or coarse jesting. No. Verse 5, you know this with certainty. No immoral, no impure, no covetous man who's an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. None. I'll be thinking, no, I don't idolatry. I don't create idolatry. I don't do any of that. I don't worship false gods. We did this episode. We talked about what idolatry is, how God defines it. You still do things of the world. You eat, sleep, you get up, you drink, and you play. God's going to accuse you of an idolater. You don't listen to the voice of God, obey his ways. He'll accuse you of idolatry and divination just as he did did Saul. That's what he said. You don't obey my voice. It's the same as idolatry and divination. Don't come up with your own definition, please. You aren't God. I'm not God. God's already defined what it is. Verse 6, let no one deceive you. God's commanding you. He doesn't want you to be deceived. Let no one deceive you with empty words. If anybody's telling you anything else in the eyes of God, they're empty words. Don't be deceived. They're empty. Why they're empty? Because God's not going to back them. That's why they're empty. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Do not associate with them. For you were formerly in darkness, the old life, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And remember, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Back in Ephesians chapter 2, that was the former manner of life. When you had those sins in your life, he says, yep, you are a child of wrath. You can't walk that way anymore. You still have some of those old sins? Well, then I would challenge, how did the power of God cleanse you from all those things? Why are you still struggling? You're going to say, oh no, but the Bible says that we continue to struggle with those things. Really? Show me here in the book of Ephesians. 
Sorry, that message isn't here. Oh, now you may say, oh, but the disciples struggled in, in the Gospels. That's right. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. We did an episode on that. Don't be like the disciples before they had the Holy Spirit. You might say, but what about the Corinthian church? But they had a lot of struggles. Oh, yes. Would you like to be like them? Let me see. As Paul closes it towards the back of the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, let me just go read a passage from there in verse 33 to, was it 33 to 34? Bear, bear with me one second while I flip there. Uh, let's see. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33 to 34. Imperative command, stop being deceived. Bad homilies or teaching corrupts good morals. Awake to righteousness in verse 34. It's awake to righteousness and stop sinning. For some of you have no knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. You're right. Corinthian church had a big problem with sin. God says they still need to awake to righteousness. God says they have to stop being deceived. God says they have bad teaching. God says they have to stop sinning. God says they have no knowledge of God. God says he speaks this to your shame. Why do you want to be like that person? They say, yeah, but, but then 2 Corinthians 2, they had the same problem. That's right. You want to be like them? Let me see. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Imperative command, test yourself. See if you're even in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you recognize this, Corinthian church? That Christ is in you unless you realize you fail the test. We did an episode on the Corinthian church. Hindsight's 2020, the things you didn't know about the Corinthian church. Oh boy, you do not want to be like them. But the problem is, you don't hear the full story. People are picking out certain things, rebukes against, against certain churches who were claiming to be Christians when they weren't. Other, Christ, other churches who had received the Holy Spirit but were backsliding and were in danger of being cut off and broken off as a branch. But people don't tell you all the facts. They just say, oh, but see, look, this church, they were sinning. Well, why do you want that? They, they have condemnation on themselves because they were in disobedience or had never received the Spirit of God. Like I said, I want to help everybody. If you have questions, you want to talk, listen, I would love to talk with you. I would love to go through and answer your questions. Give, shoot an email. We have the email up there with uh, thequestions.com. Send an email to us. Uh, we can set up a Zoom call. I can call you. We can talk. I can dialogue. I'll point you to scripture. I'll help answer your questions. Believe me, I had thousands of questions. When God first confronted me with this, I had to go reconcile all of them. It took me over a year. But I'm telling you, God's work, word exposes the lies and it's in complete harmony. You just have to see the truth and the full context of everything. Back to Ephesians chapter 5. The fruit of light consists of all goodness. All goodness. All righteousness and truth. Verse 10, proving what is pleasing to the Lord. Please show me anywhere where it says you're still struggling with sin. Nope, haven't found it yet. Verse 11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but yet some of you, I know, some of you still struggle with them. No, actually the Bible commands us to expose them and reprove them. It's disgraceful even to speak of some of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by light because everything that becomes visible is light. Light casts out all shadows and exposes everything. Nothing is hidden when light shines. So he gives another instruction to a certain portion of this church, the people in this church. Verse 14, For this reason it says, Awake, you sleeper! Arise from the dead! Because some of the people, yes, that's right, in this at Ephesians, some of the people in the church were still dead. Some of the people will, were still in darkness. Some of the people had not woken up. Why do you want to be like them? Of course, they were still struggling with sin. 
Of course, they had futility in, in their understanding and were darkened and excluded from the life of God. Of course, they were the infants bounced by the waves and carried about every, by every wind of doctrine. Of course, they were the ones that were speaking falsehood to themselves that he was commanded to stop doing. Why? Well, I don't understand. Why do people want to be that person? I'll tell you why. Because you haven't heard the truth, as I'm now telling you, exposing that that's the lie. You don't want to be that person. If you do awake from a rise, if you do wake up from your sleep, then it says Christ will shine on you. But until then, Christ has not shined in on you and he will not shine on, on you until you escape that lie that you're putting your hope and faith in because it's not the full truth of the gospel. Verse 15, therefore, an imperative command, be careful how you walk, not as the unwise man, but as a wise man because some of you still are not wise in the wisdom of God. Verse 17, imperative command, stop being foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Because some of you are still being foolish. Again, I don't speak this to judge or condemn you. I was in the same boat. I didn't know. And I'm sure if you think you're a Christian, then obviously you don't know. I want to help you. God wants to help you. But we can't help you if you won't humble yourself, if you won't come to say, oh, well, let me. And, and listen, I don't want you to, you don't just blindly accept. That's dangerous. The problem is most of us who initially come and profess a faith in Christ, we effectively just blindly follow the people that led us. Oh, yes, they'll say, oh, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we'll read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. They'll say, oh, John 3, 16, we'll read John 3, 16. Yep, that's what it says. But the problem is we believe what they explain what it means. We believe as they go through Romans Road and we read the words, but then we accept their explanation and we didn't actually read the full book of John or the full book of Ephesians or the full book of Romans. So we missed all the other passages that gave the full context. In essence, what I'm saying is, because I was guilty of it, I blindly followed and believed what I was told. Yes, I verified that some of the words that they were spoken were out of the Bible. But remember, the devil quotes the Bible. What confidence do you have in your faith if you truly came to a faith? How do you know that your leader and your teacher fully explained the, the entirety of the Word of God when they went through and did those different uh, salvation road messages using certain passages? I'm sure none of you, it was like, let me give you the salvation message in the entire book of Ephesians. We'll go through each chapter. Or the entire book of Romans, not just Romans 6.23, but what it means to be spiritually crucified and baptized with Christ, as it explained in the whole chapter. No, see, that's what people aren't being taught. That's why the devil is taking advantage of this opportunity. And I'm exposing the lies of the devil. So my prayer is that you will be filled with the Spirit. And you will always be able to give thanks and for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, our Father. Because you have put on Christ. And that is my prayer for you. The old man must be laid aside. God has to do that. And God puts on the new man for us. And we do. There's a certain result that happens. We escape from being a child of wrath. We escape from being a son of disobedience, not by our work, nothing that we do, but through faith. Do you have faith in God that he can do that? Or do you say, no, that's impossible? When God says you are to come to the true knowledge of the Son of God, to the unity of the faith, to the perfect man, to the same fullness and measure of statue of Christ, do you believe that? Do you think that man is going to struggle with sin? Do you think that man's going to be, be able to be obedient to all the commands of God that we read? Well, yeah, because it's the Spirit of God. Of course, the Spirit of God is going to walk in accordance with His will and have power to do so. Let us pray. Father, I pray that your Spirit will go forth right now and convict people. Father, let them dig into your Word. Let them read and study and meditate and read the book of Ephesians over a hundred times. To get the full context of the message. And let the lies of the devil be exposed. 
and let the captives be set free and no longer a prisoner of the slave of sin. But to overcome and walk in glorious freedom, that their desire to walk in holiness and serve you will be met with reality as their life is demonstrated as the power of God does its work in them when they're filled with all the fullness of deity by your spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.